Good morning, friends and family. Thank you for tuning in this morning, and I trust that the Word of God will bless your heart as you're listening and as we are engaging with God through His Word this morning. Previously, I've talked to you about how this COVID pandemic that we are experiencing and the suffering that goes with that, and then, unfortunately, the, the, the tremendous loss of life has brought the reality of eternity and the importance of to be prepared for eternity to the fore. I think many people who have never given thought or rarely given thought about eternity has faced now the reality of, am I prepared? Uh, we spoke about our preparation for that appointment in, in, our, in our first message in this series on perspective on eternity. The second one was, message the last time that I spoke to you was about the intermediate state that every person finds him or herself in after the moment of death until the day of judgment. Or, in other words, the return of Christ and, the, and so forth. And throughout, even today's message and next time's message, the crucial element is that there is only salvation available in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means to be prepared for the day of my death and entering into the intermediate state and even my appointment that I have with God on judgment day is determined by what I do with Christ in this life, this side of eternity. God has made it possible to be fully prepared and ready and in a state of readiness to meet God on the other side. But I must accept Christ and put my faith for salvation in Christ and in Christ alone now already. Today I want to speak to you about the resurrection. The resurrection is the next great event that will happen after a person has died physically here on earth. So this morning I want to talk to you about the resurrection of the believer, the resurrection of the unbeliever, and also conclude with the judgment of the unbeliever. Because they are connected. I first just want to make a few general remarks before we go into specifics about the resurrection. If I talk about the resurrection, I'm not talking this morning about the resurrection, praying for someone who died and God's Spirit raised that person physically up again. What I'm talking about and what the Bible here is referring to this morning is the resurrection that will take place on the day that Jesus Christ return, on the day the judgment also going to take place. It is the resurrection of all the saints and even all the unbelievers simultaneously. The resurrection of the temporal resurrection here on earth, when we, when we, we, we have so many accounts of that in the Bible, and so many times it also happened after the, 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 the canon of the Bible was closed from the first century even up to today. We have probably maybe never seen it, but we have heard of people that was raised, physically raised from the dead. Now there is a difference between the two. <coughs> the basic difference is that the final resurrection on that day that we are talking about this morning, a person in that state will receive a resurrected body that will carry on for eternity. That body will never be able to die again. But a person who is resurrected in this time will die again. That body will experience pain and suffering and even sickness again. It's limited, but... A resurrected body on that day, and we will go into more details in a few minutes on that. But that kind of body is, is not limited uh, as the earthly body is, is uh, will not su go through suffering again. And the fullness of the glory of God will break through for the believer. Unfortunately for the unbeliever, the fullness of torment and judgment and the wrath of God will break through in its fullness, 
also on that day. But we will come to that a little bit, a few minutes later from now. The other point that I want to make is that the resurrection is the height and the climax and the ultimate of the good news, or in other words, of the gospel. The whole gospel, the whole journey that God goes with a person from his or her birth here on earth, even through their death, even through the immediate, intermediate state, the height, the climax, the fullness is with a resurrection. If there was no resurrection, there would be no gospel. <clears throat> Whether a person is a believer in Jesus Christ or not, instinctively, every person actually yearns for the resurrection that believers are going to get one day, on that day. Every one of us experiencing pain, everyone experiencing sickness, everyone experiencing uh, any form of suffering of whatever kind, problems, things that break, personal issues, relationship suffering, or whatever, whatever sort of negative thing we can even think of or come up with. All of that is shouting to us that there is going to be a resurrection. We all, whether we believe in Christ, we, we yearn for a life free of what all the pain and all the negativity and all the suffering we are all going through in this life. And the answer to that, God's answer to that is the resurrection that will take place on that final day. This a bodily resurrection. This resurrection that we are talking about is a bodily resurrection. It's the body that is resurrected. A person receives a resurrected and a glorified or an everlasting body. We have a bodily resurrection because there was a bodily death. Death, physical and even spiritual, is also called an enemy of God. It is, the Bible says, it's the last enemy that will be destroyed by Christ himself. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 21 and then verse 26 says, Since by man came death, that means Adam sinned and therefore death came, as we know it. By man also came the resurrection of the dead. Through Adam came physical death. Through Jesus Christ came physical resurrection. Verse 26 says, The last enemy that will be destroyed by well, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. It will be destroyed by Christ Himself. Christ, He is an awesome being that has the ability to destroy even death, and he will. Death is called the enemy of God. And that's the final enemy that will be destroyed. After that, they will, in God's new creation, they will never be death and suffering and pain again for the believer. We will be raised because Christ was raised. Our resurrection is only possible because Jesus was raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 13 to 14 and also verse 16 and 20 I just want to read for us. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. You will see how our, resurrected, how our resurrection centers around the resurrection of Christ. It's inseparably linked to one another. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Verse 16. If the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. Verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does it mean 
when the Bible says Christ is the first fruits for all those who have fallen asleep. It means through His resurrection and glorification with the ascension, He made our resurrection on that day possible. It's the, He's the one who causes many others who follow after Him also to be raised to life as He was raised to life. So in other words, He paved the way for us, for our resurrection. Without Him being resurrected, there will be no hope and possibility for our resurrection. But because of His resurrection, we will also be raised. The resurrection is the climax and the ultimate of the good news, of the gospel. Maybe more as a side note, I just want to slip it in here. The resurrection will not only be for human beings. Now the resurrection we are talking about here is and will be for human beings. But there's also a kind of, maybe the word resurrection is not the right word. But there's a kind of resurrection that will even be for creation. Not that creation will go through the same thing as a human being go through, but it says that a new heaven and a new earth will come into existence on which and in which the, the resurrected saints with Christ and with God will live in and function in forever. Let me read two scripture passages for you. Acts 3, verse 21. It talks about Christ and it says, Christ, whom heaven must receive. That's the time we are now in. He's in heaven. Heaven has received him. Whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. And then he actually refers there to creation itself. The restoration of all things, which God as spoken by the mouth of all his prophets since the world began. So it says, the new heaven, the new earth, the new creation that will come with the resurrection is not something new that we are talking about here. It has been promised by God since even the beginning of the Old Testament times. Throughout the Old Testament times and even the prophets. Revelation 21 verse 1, the first part. And just to give you context, what's going to be described now the context of that is that it's after Christ has dealt with all his enemies, the devil, the demons, the false prophet, the fallen angels, the, 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 the antichrist, and even the unbelievers. They are all in hell now, and now the eternity with God has begun. The eternity of the saints with God has begun, and now he gets a vision of what the environment is going to look like in which the saints are united with God in, and with Christ. It says here, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. God's going to take this earth and the heavens around the earth out of existence violently. You can read in the, uh, the, the epistles of Peter and other places, even in Jesus' words, that with violence and with fire, this earth and the heavens will be destroyed with Christ's coming. And God will institute, create, if you will, a new heaven and a new earth. Perfect, that can never decay, where everything is just wonderful. Now, when will this resurrection take place? When will it be? Specifically, um, the resurrection of the believers. When is it going to take place? In short, it will take place with the second coming of Jesus Christ. With his return. He's not going to return in a few thousand or a few hundred or a number of years later that resurrection is going to take place. I just want to say there's one resurrection. There's one return of Christ, not multiple ones. But I'm going to, we're going to read here in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 to 17. And we're just going to read there where this question of when it's going to happen is answered for us very thoroughly. And it says, 
But I do not want you to be ignorant, ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. When he's talking about falling asleep, he's talking about believers who have died on, in the, the, on earth and who are now in that intermediate state. When he says that we should not sorrow as those who have no hope, he's talking about we should not as believers look at the death of another believer as if that death is now the final end and there's no hope or anything afterwards. He says that is incorrect and a, a, a wrong way to mourn. We do mourn, but we mourn with sure hope, with expectation and with um, excitement actually in our hearts of what is coming. Verse 14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. What does that mean? In a nutshell, those believers in the intermediate state, on the day that Jesus returned, he will bring those believers with him so that the resurrection can take place. Verse 15 says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. So Paul is saying, now it's not just me speaking. God himself is speaking through me now to you. He says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. What he says, those who are alive on earth as believers at the day when Jesus returned will not precede or will not uh, be treated with a greater preference than those who have already fallen asleep or have already died their physical death on this earth. Verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. So he says, Jesus is going to appear on the scene with his second coming. There's going to be thunderous noise, an angel that will blow a trumpet, that will announce that he's here. And it says those people that he brought with him, it means they are with him at the moment. He will bring them with him. And they will be raised from the dead first. They will receive their resurrected bodies first. Verse 17 says, then, in other words, after what has happened in verse 16, then we who are alive and remain, those who are Christians and remain here on, or still live on earth when Christ comes, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. What is Paul saying here? He says that at the coming of the Lord Jesus, at that moment, those who are still alive here on earth, who are believers in Jesus, they will also be transformed. They will also receive a resurrected body. And they who have, were still alive and received their resurrected body, with those who have died but now received their resurrected body, will be united as one people and immediately caught up to the Lord waiting for them in the air and the Lord will take them into glory from that moment on. And so we will always be with the Lord without end. I want to read for us here in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22 to 23 as well that affirms what I've just explained to you. It says, for as in, for as in Adam all die. That die means, first of all, physical death. Even so, in Christ, all shall be made alive, which is talking about the resurrection. Verse 23 says, but each one in its own order. Christ, the first fruits, means the one who's going before us, after those, those who are Christ's at his coming. So here we see the resurrection of the dead takes place at the coming, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now I just want to quickly share something about <coughs> the believer's body. Something that the Bible shows us and that we must actually take note of. That's part of the good news of what the state of our resurrected bodies will be like when we are followers of Jesus Christ and we are raised that day from the dead or we receive resurrected bodies. How will those resurrected bodies look like? Now I cannot exactly describe to you and give you a picture or a detailed description of how we will look like because nobody knows. But there are some things that we can know and that God wants us to know that we're going to look at. And we find that also in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42 to, uh, 42 to 44, and also verse 46 to 49. Let us quickly read that. It says, So, is the resur so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. Let me just stop there. There's the word sown, and there's the word corruption. Let's just look at the word sown. Sown means something that you put in the ground with the hope of receiving a harvest. So that's why Paul uses this word. He says, when a believer dies, that dying action where the body is sown into decay, is actually a statement and a declaration by that believer that he says or she says, I am dying with a sure hope that I will be raised again on the day that Christ returns. That sown is the earthly death. It's sown in hope. Sown means there's hope, there's expectation, there's an anticipation of the resurrection to come. What does corruption mean? Corruption, we know that the, a person who dies physically, the body that physically dies is decaying, is, is, going, is, is destroyed through the elements that destroy the body and this ruin of the body that follows. But it, it doesn't stop there. It says it is raised on that day in incorruption. It, it was sown, it died in corruption, but it will be raised in incorruption, what does incorruption means? Basically what it refers here to is unending existence, immortality, uh, even purity and perfection. Verse 43 says, it is sown, this dying body on earth is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Dishonor refers to the humility the, or the humiliation, the shame, even disgrace, indignity that is present at any person's death. There is a, 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 a humiliation and an undignified element that's present at any person's death. Whether it's on a sickbed, whether it's an accident, whether it is whatever, there is a person actually dies physically in, in an undignified state physically but on the resurrection day it is raised in glory god restores honor and dignity to its fullest to its climax dignity and honor that which we do not have human words to describe god restores to such a person who is raised from the dead it is sown in weakness what does it mean to be sown in weakness weakness refers here to the frailty that the body experienced to the disease, the body experienced to infirmities, sicknesses, feebleness, maladies, maybe even moral imperfection that's still present in the body. And therefore, I just want to say all the pain, all the suffering, all the heartache, all misery that we experience even as believers in this life is actually part of of that dying process that we all undergo. It's, it's, it's been said, and it's actually very true. It says that when a baby is born, from that moment the baby starts dying. From our birth, we actually enter the state and the process of dying, and it cannot be turned around. 
There's pain, suffering, negative situations because it's all part of the dying process, the weakness process of our bodies and of this life. But it says here, it is raised in power. When Jesus Christ raised a believer on the day of resurrection, it's raised in power. That person is then free from weakness. And all these things that we have described, this person will have the same state of power that any other heavenly being in heaven has. And that is a very great understatement. If you can think how powerful heavenly beings are, angels and what they are capable of, this is what we are going to receive if we are believers and followers of Jesus Christ. It says it's sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. What is referred to as a natural and spiritual? It's not like, not that the body that we are going to receive is like, not, there's nothing physical about it. There will be a lot physical about it. Don't, don't um, confuse natural uh, and spiritual, the, the differences with uh, not uh, more real and less real. The spiritual body is more real than the physical body or the natural body. Natural year refers to limited, restricted, lesser glory. Spiritual body refers to a real yet supernatural body with supernatural and heavenly capabilities. Just like, just as God functions in heaven, unlimited, just as angels function with ease and have powerful capabilities and can relate to all the heavenly realities that we cannot even comprehend now. So we will have bodies that can do exactly the same. We will have even more glory than the greatest angel in heaven. It says we're going to receive the glory that Christ himself has. The Bible, even in John, uh, one of the, chap one of the uh, epistles of John says, we're going to be and look like him, like Christ. That's enormous. We cannot even begin to think how it will be. But the Bible already promised us this. This, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 46 to 49 also describes our state. <clears throat> and it says, however the spiritual, it's referring to the spiritual body, the spiritual is not first but the natural and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are made of dust. As is the heavenly man, so also are those, so also are those who are heavenly. Just in a nutshell, I will read verse 49 now. It means we're going to receive heavenly bodies, glorious as the glory of Christ and able to fully function with all the realities of heaven. Heavenly bodies, not earthly bodies anymore. Heavenly bodies. Verse 49 says, And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Who is the heavenly man? Jesus Christ, the second person in the Trinity, the God-man, the heavenly man. We're going to bear that heavenly image of man that he has. We all will have that. The bodily glory of Christ and all the privileges that comes with that will be ours on that day when we are raised. Something tremendous to look forward to. There's so much more that the Bible says about the resurrection of the believer and our state. But I'm just, I, I just wanted to focus on, this, on these passages. Lastly, I just want to speak to you about the resurrection of the unbeliever and then their state afterwards or what's going to happen to them. So in short, I want to speak to you about the resurrection and the judgment of unbelievers. 
because next time I want to speak to you about the eternal rewards of the believer. I wanted to use two passages here. First, Revelation 20, verse 11 to 15, and then 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 6 to 9. But let's go to Revelation 20. There are much more. Jesus has spoken a lot about the resurrection of the unbeliever and even the judgment of unbelievers and so on. And we do not have time to go into all those passages, but I want to use these two because, because I believe that these two passages gives us perhaps the clearest picture of what's going to happen to unbelievers on the day when Jesus Christ returns. And we cannot actually separate the resurrection of the unbeliever and the judgment of the unbeliever because when God speaks about these two concepts of the unbeliever, it speaks of it simultaneously as if you, it, it, you cannot separate the two. So I'm going to handle it like that now. Revelation 20 verse 1 to 15. The preceding verses to Revelation 20 verse 1 to 15 is where uh, God through, through John describes for us um, the aspects of the second coming of Christ and the casting of Satan and his evil forces into the lake of fire. Satan is the main enemy of God with all his fallen angels and demons. But then God will turn to his remaining enemies. Who are the remaining enemies? Enemies? Yes. God on that day will have enemies besides Satan and the demons. Who are these enemies? They are all those humans who have died outside of Christ. Those humans who are in their earthly life could not care less to trust in Christ for salvation and to follow Jesus Christ. The non-Christians, the unbelievers, the wicked, whatever you want to call them, everyone who has died apart from Christ on that day, they will be God's enemies. Actually, they are already, but God gives them chance to be turned from enemies to friends. But on that day, the, 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 the opportunity to become God's friend through Jesus Christ will be over. It's not available anymore. The offer has then been withdrawn from them. And verse 11 says, Revelation 20, verse 11 to 15, it says, let's read it together. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Where can you hide from God? You cannot. But they were fleeing Heaven and earth flees. They are not guilty of anything, but the expression on God's face, the expression on Christ's face, because He's the God. He's the one on the white throne. The expression of on His face is not friendship, but is of anger and the utmost wrath. It is, so, it is almost so impossible to look in His face and the expression of, of, of wrath on his face is so horrifying that heaven and earth flees away. And now we read that every unbeliever must face Christ and look him in the eyes while he has that expression on his face. What a terrible state to be in. Verse 12. And I saw the dead. It mean, here he talks about those who have died as unbelievers. Those who have not believed in put their faith in Christ. I saw the dead, small and great. Small and great does not mean physical stature. It means significance. Whether you were insignificant among people or very significant among people, there is one standard. Whether The standard is, were you in Christ or not? That's the standard. Your history on earth will not save you from this day. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. What books are these? We will see it's the record that heaven has of each person, of all the works that was done by that person. 
as we are living here, as I'm standing right here before you, there's a book being written, there's record being kept by God in heaven of all our works, and it's stored up there, and it will be taken from the bookshelf, so to speak, that day. And every person who will stand before God on that day, their books will be opened to see their, it, in other words, their record of their works will be called up before the throne of Christ, this white throne, judgment of Christ. And these works, unfortunately, will speak against the person whose book it is. It's actually the accusation statement. Now it also says here, further in the verse, it says, And another book was opened, which is the book of life. The book which contains all the names of those who are saved. God has such a book or such a record in heaven. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. So there's a resurrection taking place of, they, they also receive resurrection, but it is a resurrection unto condemnation. So the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death in Hades, the holding place of all unbelievers that we've looked at the previous message, gave up by God's command. They were released and gave up to God so that they can be judged. They cannot be kept when God wants them there. And death in Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Second death means you die again, a second time. Second death means once and for all, the final cut off from God, the source of life. The final uh, rejection by God of such a creature or such a human being. Verse 15, and anyone, talking about these human beings, the dead standing before God, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Another word for the lake of fire is hell. It amazes me that God, who could have skipped this judgment process, He's so righteous, He's so fair, He's so perfect, He's so, so just, that even though it's obvious that those are guilty of eternal punishment and death and destruction in hell, that God will still painstakingly go through the judgment process Take each one personally before him. Look at their works. Look if their name was written in the book of life. And if it's not found, they were, will be cast into the lake of fire. It just shows you God is so fair and just and righteous that he will even give his enemies a fair judgment. I close with 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 6 to 9 where Paul also writes here and he, and he talks about the second coming of Christ and judgment and everything. And he says here in verse 6, It is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. That's what's going to happen on judgment day. God's, gonna, God's judgment means reward or repaying. And in this context, it is God will repay the unbeliever for the atrocities against God and also for the atrocities against other Christians that they've done and other human beings. In other words, God's going to treat these human beings as his absolute enemy. What a horrific thing to stand before God and be treated by him as his personal enemy. Verse 7, and to give you, 
That's the people he, Paul was writing to, the saints, the, the believers, to give you, those who are friends of God, not the enemies, the friends of God. They were the enemies of God. But they, we become friends with God when we believe in Christ. To give you who are troubled rest, final rest, with the resurrection, as we have already described. With us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So we see that this repayment of the unbeliever and also the reward of the believer takes place at the resurrection when Christ returns. In flaming fire, taking vengeance. Taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel. You do not take vengeance on people who are your beloved. You take vengeance on those who are your enemy. Now, God, it says here, God's going to take the day of judgment. The judgment of the unbeliever is the moment of where God will vent his wrath in its fullest on the unbeliever. It's a shocking, terrible, most horrific experience and state, and that will carry on forever. Those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have decided, well, you know what? I don't need the gospel. I don't need Jesus. I can carry on with my life. I, I'm okay. Those are the ones that's being talked about here. Verse 9. These, these people that is receive the vengeance of God, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Heavy words, heavy statements, but it's true. And we on this side of eternity, my brothers, sisters, friends, whoever is watching, whoever is listening, we need to take note of this important utmost important announcement. No one will escape it. Not me who's talking to you. Not the technical people that's even behind the cameras. No one in this church, no one in the universe will escape this. The only way of escape, remember John the Baptist said that we must flee from the wrath to come. This is the wrath that he was talking about. And the way of escape, the way to flee from this wrath is through Christ. It's the only way. Put your faith and trust for salvation in Christ and follow Him. You cannot just mentally believe in Him. You cannot just say you believe in Him. Your actions must, must believe with your head. Follow Him. Revelation 14 talks about that, the, that those who are saved are those who followed the Lamb wherever He goes. Let's follow Him. Thank you that you tuned in this morning. And uh, I just want to pray and then we'll close. Lord, thank you that you made a way of escape and that you made this wondrous resurrection possible for those who believe in you. And I pray those of us who are still here in this life, who still have the opportunity to make right with you through Jesus and have not done that, Father, I pray that your spirit will still keep on convicting them and draw them to their knees before you in repentance and belief in Jesus Christ. And all but those of us who have already put our faith in Jesus for salvation, that we will stay faithful and not fall away. That we will not backslide, but stay faithful to you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you that you tuned in. God be with you. Until the next time. Goodbye.